So I, for example, there's a, a rather large scene in that book where Ralph Waldo Emerson comes to the cave. Well, first of all, you have to know about Ralph Waldo Emerson. So I read a whole lot of stuff about him. He was a cult figure in the world of declamation, that is, making speeches. And, uh, he had a cult following, and when he came down from Louisville, he had a bunch of his cult followers with him on that trip. On the other hand, he had a lot of original thinking, and if you Google on it, uh, sayings of Ralph Waldo Emerson, you get pages and pages of, of sayings that he used at one point or another. <laughs> well, one of the statements in, uh, in this long list of Ralph Waldo Emerson's famous sayings is, uh, uh, if somebody tells you how honest they are, it's time to count the spoons. Well, what can I do with that? It's so obscure, nobody knows that Ralph Waldo Emerson said that unless they look at this list. So I thought, well, the thing to do is to equip Mildred, the cook, at Three Spoons Inn with a statement she uses on a white kitchen helper that, you, you know, if, uh, you want trust why it's time to count the spoons. She, uh, that's overheard by Charlotte Brown. She tells Stephen that. Stephen tells Ralph Waldo Emerson that in a scene where Ralph Waldo Emerson is so curious he wants to have a meal at a black guide's house. And so that whole scene is interacted with what I know about Ralph Waldo Emerson in terms of his decision making, his free will, his curiosity, and his spotting of opportunities. <laughs> so he spotted right away that Stephen Bishop was a rare person among all the kinds of people he had met. So that's a, an opportunity to write a scene that engages uh, the best of everything that these two people do. So Ralph Waldo Emerson is interested in Thomas Bishop, the little boy, and he wants to see what he knows. Well, the little boy is very smart. He He's given three objects. One of them is alive and the other two are inanimate objects. And he Ralph Waldo Emerson asked him, what's the difference between these three things? And he says, one of them is alive. Well, as a small child, that's a reasonable answer to a smart child. And you assume that smart people have smart children. And so uh, we establish uh, Charlotte Brown's curiosity from a very early age, her interest in numbers. Well, I had to equip her with number facility and interest in numbers because if she's going to be his wife, she's going to have to be able to use a lot of numbers to describe how far things are, how long it takes, how big something is. And uh, in other words, she's got to have this number interest somewhere in her, her life. And since this was fiction, I can invent Charlotte Bishop. So I equip her with the ability to use numbers from the very beginning. And when I show this to black people, as I did several times, uh, they don't have any problem with that because all of them have developed an interest in something very early in their life uh, from here, there, or everywhere uh, that they can relate to. Uh,
and there's a question of uh, can you teach yourself to read and write? Because Stephen Bishop is, is described as having taught himself to read. And that he read the newspaper and uh, so I met a professor at uh, Oxford University on a trip down there to research McGuffey readers. And he was black and he taught black studies and he and his brother taught themselves to read and write growing up in Morocco. <laughs> Well, I said, how did you do that? And he explained that, and that's what's in the book. Uh, how these two individuals taught themselves to read and write. Uh, and uh, nobody has disputed that. I suppose somebody may come along later who disputes it, but I've never had any black person complain to me that that book is not authentic. Uh, on the other hand, is it great literature? Well, I, I'm not, I'm too close to, to say. Uh, it was the best I could do at the time. I suppose if I were to write it again, I would do a few things differently, but not very much. There's a signature of Stephen and Thomas in the passageway between Snowball and on the way to Echo River just after you get uh, from, uh, what's his name's concert hall. Uh, Ole Bull's concert hall. Yeah, just, just past that there's a signature of Stephen and Thomas yep. on the cave wall right there, yes. which is kind of cool. Well, that's why I wrote Thomas as not liking the cave, because he was forced to carry uh, lamp oil, which was cottonseed oil, in the cave, and, and big disappointment to Stephen, and uh, this is another big part of this book. Charlotte says, well, you know, you, you, you can't control where the cave goes. Why should you be able to control what your son is interested in? Um, but anyway, uh, I knew that Thomas had gone at least that far into the cave, and that seemed a good place to have what amounts to Stephen's last trip, uh, to go beyond uh, where their signature appear. Uh, we know that Thomas was on that trip uh, and what they found was really what somebody showed me who was a guide that beyond uh, the uh, snowball dining room uh, and continuing in what amounts to uh, uh, El Gore uh, eventually takes you to Cathedral Domes, which when it was discovered a number of years later there were footprints of two people going in and coming out. People didn't know who the two people were, so I am free as a novelist to have those people be Thomas, Stephen Bishop and Thomas Bishop. Uh, of course, they didn't call it Cathedral Domes because it hadn't been, quote, discovered and named yet. That's cool. So, um, you wrote about Sand Cave with the uh, professor of history. Uh, I don't want so much the story of of Floyd Collins to recite that, but tell me the story about how you hooked up with this professor. And I understand that you did some exploring in Sand Cave to get a better feel for it. Yeah. And I want you to talk about hooking up with the professor and 
I'm sorry, I'm just drawing yeah, some okay, blanks this morning. <laughs> All right, everybody knows about Floyd Collins, who was trapped in 1925 in Sand Cave. And after a three or four week long rescue effort was found dead in Sand Cave. Uh, that was a sensational story at the time in all of the newspapers and on radio. So he was one of the characters that I was interested in because I saw his name in several places in Crystal Cave. And he had discovered Crystal Cave, and so I was curious about his curiosity and what led him to become a cave explorer. Obviously, he had a desire to make a living or make money from caving. and. Uh, I knew that much about him, but after a while I felt that I had, I knew enough about Floyd Collins to be able to write a book about that event. And uh, I wrote an outline of the book and sent it to my literary agent who uh, said she was interested in that book and I should continue to develop it. Well. I suddenly realized that I had been spending my time learning everything that was in print about Floyd Collins. Uh, and I, I knew a lot about what he had done in Crystal Cave because I could trace his exploration through his signatures on the wall and could get some idea of how his curiosity worked. <coughs> But there was an awful lot that I recognized that really lay off in the undescribed, undocumented side of his life. Uh, so it, at any rate, about that time I got a telephone call from Robert Murray, who described himself as a professor, graduate professor of history at uh, Penn State University, and that he had been specializing in the 1920s and had written a, uh, a book about the 108th ballot, which is about a uh, Democratic convention in New York City that. It's uh, over there somewhere. But <laughs> it's over there in your bookshelf somewhere. Yeah. At any rate, uh, he taught graduate students and he was interested in Floyd Collins and he had just finished reading The Longest Cave and I have a, in the end of that a historical brief on Floyd Collins. He said, uh, so I was wondering about that and I've interviewed a guy on, an old guy on Staten Island who was one of the miners who tried to recover the body and did recover the body in April after the uh, abandonment of the effort to rescue Floyd. And he said, this guy said, uh, oh, you don't want to touch the Floyd Collins story because uh, they'll get you if, if you try to do that. He said, who, who would get you? Well, he said, there, there are people who don't want that story told. <laughs> This is the old guy. And uh, so he was interested in what I do about that sort of thing. And I said, well, look, uh, you're not a caver, so you, you don't really understand caves at all. And I spent my life caving. So that's part of what you need to know to write about Floyd Collins. And well, first I saw him as a competitor, and he saw me as a competitor because I was interested in Floyd Collins. Well, the more I <clears throat> talked to him, the more I realized he had done some research beyond what I had done, including interviewing some people. So at that point, having uh, written uh, The Caves Beyond and uh, with Red Watson writing The Longest Cave, I 
figured I knew a lot about collaboration, and so I suggested, well, have you thought of collaborating uh, on a book like that? I, I would probably be willing to collaborate with you. And he said, you would? And I said, uh, yeah. I said, uh, collaboration is not for everybody, but I think we could together come up with a better book than either of us could put together. So he said, well, I, I need to meet you and understand you a little better. And I said, well, the same here. So he arranged to come to Yellow Springs, where I lived at the time, at a time when there was a terrific gas shortage. And uh, we spent time in our living room talking over approaches to history. And uh, of course, this was his field. I said, how do you do history? Well, uh, he said, but you spend your time trying to find original sources and not reading secondary stuff. Well, I had read the secondary stuff, so I said, well, there aren't very many original sources left. And he said, well, I know that, but here and there are going to be some old people who are going to remember some things, and uh, if we collaborate, we've got to talk to those people uh, before we're going to understand that at all. And I said, well, it may be that we also need to understand Sand Cave from a point of view of somebody who understands caves. He said, well, yeah, that would be a good idea also. That's a spam call that comes nearly every day. And some days the spam call comes several times. At any rate, talking this over with Bob Murray and uh, drinking some wine, and uh, the more lubricated we got, the more we warmed up to each other. And, I had asked him the basic question, how do you do history? He said, well, you have to go find original sources. And that's what you spend the most time on. So I said then that I was going to do my best to explore Sand Cave. And he said he was going to start lining up interviews. And I suggested some people that ought to be on the interview list and that I would be happy to uh, tackle some of those people also. So that's where we began to work on the book. And he at that point said, well, you're a better writer than I am, based on what he read in The Longest Cave. And I said, I probably am, because I've read your book 108th Ballot, and uh, you're a professor who writes in long sentences, compound sentences, and uh, you can't do that about caves because caves are so complex that you can't use complex sentences to describe something that is confusing and complex. <laughs> That's one of the things we learned from writing about Mammoth Cave. Some of the literary people in New York to whom we sent the final manuscript said, I'm lost. We can't understand any of this stuff. So Watson and I had to rewrite the beginning of each chapter and put in there a paragraph describing where this is taking place in relation to everything else we talked about. That solved that problem and put in. well, they never looked at the maps. You know, we said, didn't you look at the maps? No, you lay those aside and just read the manuscript. Well, only literary people would do that. Uh, cavers would look at the map. <laughs> so anyway, we, I'd run the, I, I had found this problem and I knew I was a better writer than Murray was. He was a 
a, an extremely good historian, but he was not a, what I would call an excellent writer. So he began to send me manuscripts, and I began to edit them from the point of view of knowing a lot about caves. And so some of his, a lot of his prose got chopped into shorter sentences with less use of words ending in ing. Uh, and <clears throat> so there was a lot of grammar shortening as well as supplying facts about caves that were important to get right. And meanwhile, I, I knew the superintendent very well at Mammoth Cave. I had discovered that he was a dys dyslexic person, that when you sent him information, he was not able to read it and get information on it. He would hand it off to somebody and said, what does the letter say? And the person would relate to him what the letter said. And ever after that, I told everybody, if you're going to deal with this superintendent, you need to talk to him in person on the phone. Don't count on any letter you send him to be read and understood by the superintendent. And I discovered that one day when he called me up and he said, uh, you people in CFR, you think you could get away with everything and you don't tell me anything. And I said, CFR, boing, dyslexic. Well, I knew that and I, I'm not sure how many other people knew that, but I then had everybody communicate by phone with him and things went rather smoothly, even though he had other run-in with people on his staff who didn't understand that. At any rate, I was on pretty good terms with the superintendent and told him that I was uh, teaming up with the history professor we were writing a story about Floyd Collins and we wanted to, I wanted to get in Sand Cave. He said, well, Sand Cave is locked and uh, I'm not going to officially allow you to get in Sand Cave. He said, if anything happened to you, boy, it would be the end of my career. <laughs> I said, well, that's probably true. And he said, but uh, if you can get in there and uh, not get caught, why, uh, it's up to you. <laughs> so that was the tacit, go ahead, but don't get caught. And I'm not going to officially approve this. So that's when we worked out the scheme for breaking into Sand Cave at night and uh, surveying it and uh, taking pictures and getting to understand the cave. Well, turns out that the cave itself was the Rosetta Stone that enabled us to unlock everybody's story about this rescue attempt particularly the people who claimed to get in there and help rescue Floyd, because we could tell who was telling the truth, who was exaggerating, and who was just flat lying, since we knew the cave intimately. So that was my interaction with Bob Murray. Uh, I edited every line in the book heavily, uh, both in terms of the cave facts and knowledge and in terms of, of shortening and clarifying the grammar. So it was a genuine uh, uh, collaboration. All of the writing I've ever read about collaboration is don't do it. <laughs> One of you is going to be angry and uh, won't speak to the other author. But my collaborations have been successful because the authors ended up respecting each other's contribution and were professional enough to, to work with it. So that's my story of collaborating with Robert Murray. Robert Murray died a short time ago, 
So he's not here to defend himself. 